And Nicholas Aguzin, a Chief Executive Officer of the Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing, joins us this morning right here in our studio. Nicholas, so good to have you on. Let's talk first about this visit by, of course, uh, Hong Kong's uh, CE John Lee. Um, what are the expectations for this trip? Yes, well, it's a, thank you very much. Good morning, Daisy. It's a great opportunity to be here and a great opportunity to tell a little bit more of the Hong Kong story after so many years of the COVID impact and the inability for people to travel. There are so many areas whereby Hong Kong and Singapore and the broader ASEAN can actually work together, that that's the main purpose. We want to make sure that we understand each other, we make the connections, and we try to get more you know, business flowing both ways in the future. Mm -hmm. And speaking of business flowing both ways, um, let's talk about um, HK, HKEX's uh, U.S. office um, in New York. And how, how do you think that's going to promote um, you know, the Hong Kong marketplace and attract more foreign investment? Yes. Well, in 2017, we opened our office in Singapore. Today, we have about 12 people here in Singapore. And that was the first offshore office that we had, that we had a few offices in the mainland as well. And so part of this is our internationalization push. About half of uh, the investors in our market are actually for international investors. One critical thing that we want to do is to make sure that we're close to those international, those international clients and investors that trade in our markets. So New York is, is the first step. We opened that office. We've also announced that we're opening the office in London. So we're trying to spread our wings and make sure that we can be close to those clients and address the needs they have. Yeah, on the London office, um, any updates on that front? When could we see it uh, open officially? Yeah, I mean, we have like the full office set up. We have all the approvals. It's just that we're find, trying to look for the exact date when we'll, I'll be able to travel and to make sure that we can, you know, do a very nice, um, you know, show there with like all the different participants from the market. So it should be over the next couple of months. And, and speaking of the Singapore office, it's been five years since it was opened you said, mm -hmm. in 20, uh, 2017. Uh, any, you know, plans for up, uh, upgrades, uh, expansions of the Singapore office? Yeah, I mean, we, as I mentioned today, we have about 12 people in, 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 in Singapore. They, they provide a lot of services, like interacting with like people, including we, we own the London Metals Exchange. So we have even some salespeople from, from the uh, London Metals Exchange in Singapore. So it's a great way of connecting investors, issuers, also from, from an issuer side, there's about 100 companies from the ASEAN market that are actually listed in Hong Kong. So they also provide some services to those companies that want to continue using Hong Kong as a way of attracting capital to use in their own markets. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Nicholas, how much are you expecting international investors to grow by? Clearly, because uh, we've seen the, you know, the opening of offices in, around the world. And, and also, which are your biggest players? Yeah. So um, it, it really depends on a market by market basis. Historically, we've had a very good presence from markets like, for example, the US, a lot of long only funds were very active participants. Europe was also a key, a key part of our business. About half of the international investors that were present in our market were actually from Asia outside of China. So, so it's, it's, it's a lot of like participation from many areas. The region that has been growing quite a bit over the last uh, few months, I would say, is the Middle East. Middle East has a lot of areas that they want to continue investing, especially where, when it relates to new economy companies. And so though, though that's an area that we've seen quite a bit of growth. And, and something um, that you guys have been doing to attract more investment uh, is the Raminbi Hong Kong dollar dual counter scheme. Yes. So um, are more stocks participating um, because of the scheme and has it been able to attract more, more companies? Um, how much more do you expect it to expand trading by? Yes. Well, initially, the key change that we've made, I mean, uh, companies could always trade in renminbi in hong kong for a long time but we set up a, a mechanism around market makers mm. so we call it dual counter market makers that make sure that there's no arbitrage between these two desks and the two prices in renminbi and hong kong dollars are consistent so that was like the key initiative we had a group of a little over 20 companies that actually decided to participate in this 
We're, this is just the beginning. We're expanding it. It'll go. A lot of companies have actually shown interest in that. They want to be part of this. Eventually, pretty much every, every um, a company will trade in both renminbi and Hong Kong dollars. Now, it's not as big right now until we get the southbound renminbi, the mainland investors. Mm. Today, they have to invest in Hong Kong dollars. So there's some changes that are being de- done to the infrastructure that will allow these mainland investors to inve- invest directly in renminbi. Once that happens, if you think about it today, that flow is about 30, 40 uh, billion Hong Kong dollars every day. There's an, a, a, an exchange that it's done. So that should be in renminbi. Once that happens, there should be a huge flow which is going to position Hong Kong very well as a renminbi trading hub. It's going to help the renminbi internationalization. And of course, it's going to give a lot more options to investors and to issuers. Mm. Speaking of um, inflows uh, from the mainland, um, at the same time, we are seeing sputtering growth in China. And that, you know, has put quite a dampener on um, the economy. And and how has it affected uh, the investment flows for you guys? Uh, when do you think it could pick up? Yeah. So clearly, Hong Kong is a very international market. So it's affected by everything that happens in China. It's affected also what happens here around the world. And with interest rates going up, with inflation going up, a possible recession, I mean, those things are factors that affect Clearly, the, the expectations around China are also factors. China started strongly with an expectation of it's going to be a very high growth because of the reopening and everything that was going on. I still believe that the growth will be north of 5%, mm-hmm. although some people started having expectations that it would be substantially above that. But still, it's going to be about like a third of the global growth. It's going to come from China. So whether it's 5 to 6%, is still a healthy level of growth. Mm-hmm. Um, I would expect that as though that growth starts being realized and, and companies start getting their earnings up, we're going to see some of that translate into better activity into our market. So you're optimistic there. Um, Hong Kong saw its lowest fundraising in 20 years uh, in the first part of this year. What are your expectations for the second half? Then uh, what are some of the factors you think uh, could affect uh, this uh, and uh, the number of listings that you see this yeah. in this second part of the year. So this is very interesting because, I mean, it was uh, very tough globally, actually. So when we look at the global capital raise in the first six months of the year, I mean, we saw that total capital raise came down by 40 percent, I mean, around the world. But then in Hong Kong, the actual number of companies that went public up until last Friday was like 39 companies went public this year so far. So 39 companies is a fairly healthy number. Now, offerings were a little bit smaller because the markets are a a, a bit choppy and therefore people prefer to wait and to time it a little bit more or just to do a smaller offering. So in terms of capital raise, it's a single percentage digit below last year. So it's not that much considering that globally it's 40 percent down. And our market, as I said, is very, very international. But one of the key things that it's happening with the announcement in March that now Chinese players are going to be able to participate in Southbound in international company, we expect Hong Kong to be the only market in the world where you can actually get all this international capital that is used to investing in in Hong Kong. This is like all the key European, American, international companies. But then now there will be this unique opportunity to have Chinese domestic investment mm. that can invest in international companies that decide to list in Hong Kong. This is very unique. There's no other market that provides that uh, strength. So we're very hopeful about what that can create for the future. So okay, that is one of the ways that you're trying to get, um, you know, it flows in both, in both directions. Mm-hmm. At the same time, does the HKEX have any more plans to boost IPOs uh, for, for, of course, the Hong Kong, for Hong Kong? Um, and, and what is your IPO outlook for next year? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, if we look at, for example, the last week of June, just in the last week of June, we had over 30 companies filing their A1s, their applications for listing mm-hmm. in just one week. Over 30 companies. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a pretty, pretty impressive number. So we're seeing a lot of interest. And what we did also is we're starting to address the companies of tomorrow. So there's a new specialist technology chapter that we just implemented this year that is targeted at companies that may not have the revenues. Mm. They may not have the um, uh, profitability. But there are companies where there's a lot of research and development investment. They have great uh, sponsors, great uh, investors. 
And what they want to do is to make sure that they raise the capital to create those opportunities for the future in space technology, quantum computing, a lot of these areas. So that chapter was just implemented a, few, a couple of months ago. And that would create even more opportunities in the new economy, high tech sector. And we're very optimistic in terms of like how that is being received by the market. And actually, just like a couple of weeks ago, we had our first filing on that 18C uh, specialist technology chapter. Well, Nicholas, um, as we come to the end of our chat, I do want to ask you as well your assessment of how uh, Hong Kong stocks have performed amid this economic environment. We talked quite a bit about the uh, uncertainty that we're seeing high interest rates, we're seeing inflation, you know, being stubborn. Um, how would you assess how uh, Hong Kong stocks have done in the first half of this year? I think you said it very well. It's, it's, a, it's a stubborn environment in a way. I mean, it's a challenging environment. We had inflation, we had like interest rates and all the global macro environment. Hong Kong being very international is affected for, for, from all these things that happen around the world. Um, at the same time, it has this, this ability to, to be part of like two systems in a way and be part of China and be part of international which I think positions it very well. We said that about a third of the global growth will come from, from China. About like half of the growth will come actually from Asia in, in this year and over the next few years, most likely. Hong Kong Exchange is incredibly well positioned to benefit from all those trends. So we're optimistic about the future. All right, Nicholas, thank you so much. Appreciate your time and your insights this morning. Nicholas Agus in there. He's a chief executive of the HKEX.